So this is 4.3, which is going to be the connection between the first and the second derivative with the graph of the original function. So there's a lot in here. I'm going to split this into two videos. So first we're going to talk about what the first derivative tells you about the original function. So a lot of this is going to be the procedure for how to do it, but you also are going to need to justify. And they are really picky on the AP test about the wording of the justification, and we'll go over all of that when we do examples. But it's definitely something that you are going to need to practice so that you know the quickest way to say things because a lot of times people just say too much and then end up losing points because they've said too much. And so we'll go over all of that when we do examples, but it's definitely something you need to practice. So first, you're going to need a continuous function on a closed interval, differentiable on the open interval. It could be differentiable at the endpoints, but it doesn't have to be. So we just need the open interval. So when the first derivative is positive, that means your original function is increasing. And when the first derivative is negative, then your original function is decreasing. So that's going to be something that you're going to have to not only show the work for, but also justify. So I'm going to go through an example of that so you can see. So this one, where is this function increasing? Where is it decreasing? So the first thing I'm going to need to do is find the derivative. So it's going to be 6x squared minus 12. I set that equal to 0. So that's going to be, I can divide everything by 6. So then x squared equals 2. Don't forget about the plus or minus. So it's going to be plus or minus square root of 2. So then what we're going to need to do is make a sign chart. So I'm going to put negative square root of 2 and positive square root of 2 on the sign chart. So I'm looking for where is the derivative positive, where is it negative. So here what I'm going to do is put signs of f prime. So I'm plugging values in to either one. You can use this one, you can use the one where you divided by 6, doesn't matter. You just want to know whether it's positive or negative. So if I plug something in, to the left of negative square root of 2, I should be getting that it's positive. Something in between negative square root of 2 and positive square root of 2, it's going to be negative. And then greater than square root of 2, it's going to be positive. The signs don't always alternate like this, so you do want to make sure that you plug in values. But if you are having trouble, you can always assume that it does, because that is most common. But just remember that it doesn't always alternate like this. So the sign chart, those of you that took AB especially, are probably really used to making sign charts. This is not enough of a justification. So this specific question doesn't ask you to justify. In general, you are going to need to justify these. So you are going to need to explain what the sign chart shows. So this is really helpful, and it's going to help you determine where the function is increasing, where is it decreasing. But the actual wording of the justification you, is not going to be just because I used a sign chart. So I'm going to say f is increasing on the interval where the first derivative is positive. So that's going to be from negative infinity to negative square root of 2, not including negative square root of 2, because right at negative square root of 2, the derivative is going to be 0. So it's not increasing or decreasing at these points. And it's also going to be increasing from square root of 2 to infinity. And the reason, so I would say, because f prime is greater than 0. You want to be really careful with the wording. You can say because the derivative is positive, um, when we start talking about maximums and minimums, the wording is going to be similar, but there are other things that you can say. Um, but what you want to be careful with is that it's very clear what derivative you're talking about. This one, there is only one function. If the problem is referring to multiple functions, you want to be very specific. If it's unclear that you know which derivative is positive, or if you say the slope, it's unclear what the slope you're talking about is, then you are going to lose points. So I would just say f prime. So be really specific with what derivative you're talking about, whether you're talking about the first derivative or the second derivative, and what function's derivative you're looking at. 
And then for decreasing, we would say f is decreasing on the interval on the interval negative square root of 2 to positive square root of 2. And the reason is because f prime is negative. So same thing, we want to be really specific with the wording. So we want to use the actual name of the function. So a corollary, if f prime is 0 everywhere, then that means the function is a constant. So you could potentially see that. It doesn't usually happen very often, but um, I mean, you could have something like this where it's there are multiple pieces that are going to be constant. You could have one piece that's going to be constant. So on this interval and this interval, um, f of x would just be a constant. So it's going to be a horizontal line. So you could have entire intervals where the first derivative is equal to zero. So this is the first derivative test for local extrema. So this is for local. This is not for absolute. It's going to be different for absolute. Um, so absolute on a closed interval we looked at in 4.1. We will do some examples with absolute extrema that are on an open interval or no interval at all, but this is specifically for local extrema. So if f prime changes from positive to negative, let's type it right there to be negative, um, f prime changes from positive to negative at c, then f has a local maximum. So if you look at this picture, so here's an example of a local maximum. So the first derivative is going from positive to negative because the original function is going from increasing to decreasing. So when that's happening, you have a local maximum. And then other way around for a local minimum. So if you look at the picture here, the first derivative is negative and then it's positive, which means the original function is going to be decreasing and then increasing. If there's no sign change, then that means there's no local extreme value. So we're going to have to find critical points. So if you need to find local extrema, the first thing you're going to do is find the critical points. That's the same thing you do if it's asking for absolute extrema on a closed interval. Um, the, but the rest of it is going to be different. So you find the critical points, and then you have to make sure that the derivative actually does change sign on either side. So you are going to need to do a sign chart for local extrema. At endpoints, you're not usually asked to justify what's happening at endpoints, um, but this would be the reasoning you would want to use. I've never seen a free response problem that asks you to justify what's going on at endpoints. Usually, they would leave the endpoints out of the interval, so they would ask you for local extrema on the open interval, so you're not usually having to justify. But at the left endpoint, you're looking at what's happening to the right, and at the right endpoint, you're looking at what's happening to the left. So that would be how you would justify um, what is happening at the endpoint, whether it's going to be a local max or a local min. So then here we'll go through this example. So the first thing we want to do is find the critical points. So f prime 3x squared minus 27, set that equal to 0. So I can divide by 3. So I'm going to get x equals plus or minus 3. So I make a sign chart. And this is going to be the signs of f prime. So one of the questions I get a lot is, where am I plugging numbers into? Are you plugging numbers into the original function or into the first derivative? So it does help to label the sign chart because then that's telling you what signs you're looking for. So for local extrema, I'm looking for whether the first derivative is positive or negative. So I'm plugging into the first derivative, not into the original function. So if I plug numbers into the left, I'm going to get positive. And then in between negative 3 and positive 3, I'm going to get negative and then positive. So again, just like with justifying increasing um, and decreasing, the sign chart is not enough. The sign chart is going to help you figure out where there's going to be a maximum or a minimum, but you have to actually explain what the sign chart is showing. So if it's helpful, you can do things like, you know, this is where the original function is increasing, this is where it's decreasing, and then this is where it's increasing again. So 
right here is where there's going to be a local maximum and right here is where there's going to be a local minimum. Now you also need to make sure that you are um, making sure to answer the question. So if the question is specifically asking you for the x values where this is occurring, you're only giving the x values. If it's asking you for the actual value, that means y value. So in that case, you need to plug these, the negative three and the three into the original function to get the actual extreme value. So I would say, F has a local max at x equals negative 3 because F prime changes from positive to negative. That's the quickest way to say it. So you can also say stuff like F prime is positive to the left and negative to the right. It can get a little bit wordy when you start doing that. So this is, I think, the easiest way to word the justification. And if you plug negative three into the original function, you should be getting 57. So 57 is the actual value. And then I do the same thing with the minimum. So F has a local min at X equals three because F prime changes from negative to positive. Again, other ways to word this, I think this way is the quickest and I think this way is the easiest. And we do want the actual value, we want the y value. When you plug three into the original function, you're gonna get negative 51. And so that's the actual value of the minimum. This one does say to identify any absolute extrema. This one doesn't have any. If you think about a cubic function, it would be going forever this way and then forever up here. So these would just be local, not absolute. Okay, and then this one, it's giving us the first derivative. So it's giving us that f prime is equal to this times this. So we don't need to take the derivative. It's already giving us the derivative. And it's also telling us that g of x, so this function right here, is always going to be negative. So you would make a sign chart for this one and use the fact that this function is always going to be negative. So because this we had in the example we just looked at, the x squared minus nine, the sign chart is going to be exactly the same as the one we just made, except it's going to be the opposite because we're multiplying it by a negative. So if I made a sign chart, I put negative three and three, it's gonna end up being negative, positive, negative. So then my answer to this one is gonna be B. So all of that was how the first derivative affects the original function. So in the next video, we're going to look at what the second derivative tells us about the original function.